I think it's perfect that I'm back here <coughs> talking about being real. Because we founded this community on being real and what that means. So this particular uh, exploration of real is, was inspired by something that I read to the children earlier from the Velveteen Rabbit. And I want to I want to just read a portion of what I read to them so that it's uh, is recorded as part of the talk. And it is from the Velveteen Rabbit or How Toys Become Real by Marjorie Williams. What is real? asked the Velveteen Rabbit one day when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender before Nana came to tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside of you or a Stick out handle. Real is not how you are made, said the skin horse. It's the thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily, or have sharp edges, or have to be very carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints, and very shabby, and you, you lose your nose like Bunny Hopper did. Mm -hmm. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who just don't understand. Once you are real, you can't become unreal again, because it lasts for always. In order to become real, we have to be willing to have the fur rubbed off of us, to get a little bit of floppy in the joints, or to have our rough edges softened, or all of the above. There's so much wisdom in this book, and I was delighted to find the, the book that today's talk is based on by Tony Raffin D'Antonio. She's a psychotherapist and a social worker. She actually used to be in the entertainment industry. She uh, lived in New York and discovered through her own process that what she needed to do to be real was to follow her heart and go back to school and become a psychotherapist and a social worker. And everyone was aghast when she left her very you know, kind of fancy uh, job in the entertainment industry. And she said, no, this isn't real for me. And so she through her practice and through her love of the Velveteen Rabbit, came up with these principles of how to be real. So she describes the difference between being real and not being real. And every time I say real, she has it in italics with a capital R. Okay, so picture that in your mind. She contrasts that with living in the land of objects. Again, in italics, capital O. And she says, the difference between living in the land of objects and being real is this. Once we accept the pervasive messages of the object, capital O, culture, once we believe that we should be perfect, we start to feel shamefully inadequate. No one, after all, can ever obtain the object ideal. As a result, we tumble into a never-ending cycle of struggle, self-condemnation, and flailing attempts to ease the pain through money, power, drugs, sex, food, or purchases. We might call it retail therapy. <laughs> Just think about the process of abandoning your real self. You let go of a dream here or a feeling there. Elements of yourself fall away so quietly that you don't even notice. But something inside of you feels the loss. When she was describing that, it reminds me of the energy that it takes to wear the mask. Right? The 
energy that it takes to pretend to be something that we're not. And what happens when we, we free up that energy by just taking off the mask and being who we really are. So these 12 principles that she's elicited from this little tiny book, her book is much longer than the Velveteen Rabbit, help us to do that, help us to take off the mask. The microphone is so you're going to hear that one of the uh, principles is real, is flexible. No kidding. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So principle number one, real is possible, first and foremost. Real is possible, no matter how much we bought into the illusion of the object culture. It is possible for us to be real. The Velveteen Rabbit, from his, his inception, knew there was something inside of him that said, I'm not just a stuffed bunny full of sawdust. Something else is possible, and it's real. Principle number two, and the first principle leads into this one. Real is a process. Right? Real is, um, remember what the, the wisdom of the skin horse said. It doesn't happen all at once. Right? We, we have been enculturated. But the skin horse reminds us that it takes time for us to become real. And I love this wisdom here. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or who have sharp edges. And when I read that, I thought, yeah, it's really hard to be real when we go through life easily offended. Or taking everything personally. I had a great question asked of me many years ago, and I've shared it with you in the past, but it's worth repeating. You know, am I willing to be curious about that which offends me? Right? Am I willing to have my rough edges knocked off, tumbled together, and softened? So real is a process. I want to, uh, to share again one of the paragraphs from what Renee read earlier. This doesn't happen without some effort. It's a process. A real life demands your active participation. Real life does not happen to us. Becoming real, this is me now, not Tony. Becoming real is not passive. It's something that we design and create. And real doesn't mean that you have to be perfect at anything. Real means that we are willing to grow and we're willing to learn through experiences. And as a result, we know that we always did our best. So what can support us? What can support this process in us becoming more real? First of all, close relationships make us feel more real. I don't know about you, but there's nothing like my closest relationships to remind me just how real I am. <laughs> Work that matters makes us feel real. Work that has meaning, work that enlivens us and empowers us, and, and work that stretches us makes us real. Creativity and growth make us real. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Teaching, nurturing, and caring for one another makes us feel real. And not just feel real, but be real. Principle number three, real is emotional. Now, this doesn't mean that we go around emotionally vomiting on one another all the time, okay? What, what this principle is speaking to is that we are emotionally available and intelligent, okay? It means that we honor our feelings, right? We listen to our feelings, and we can accurately represent what we're feeling. Um, Tony talks a lot in the book about the differences between how men and women feel their feelings, right? And, and how women are more comfortable, you know, being sad, men are more comfortable being angry. I'm hugely generalizing here, so just bear with me, right? But the point of that, the whole discussion is, is that when we are real, we are aware of what we're actually feeling. We don't need to stuff it, we don't need to interpret it, we don't need to project it, right? There's a, an interesting thing about really being real is that we don't need to act on or express every feeling that we're having, right? But we do need to observe what we're feeling 
so that we can be real. Right? She also talks about um, that once we are more aware of our true feelings, that's when we can become present to the true feelings of others. Right? If, if, we're, if we're not conscious or aware of our own feelings, it's virtually impossible for us to understand the feelings of others. And that leads to the fourth principle. Notice how she's built these one on top of another. Real is empathetic. Right? Now again, you know, you look all these deep disclaimers. That does not mean that we walk around like a sponge and think that, oh, you know, I'm absorbing everybody else's feelings. No. True empathy means that I have the capacity to observe and seek to understand what you are feeling. Right? It's different from sympathy. Sympathy literally means to be in agreement with. Right? So when we're sympathizing with someone, we almost do feel like we're kind of merging with them. Right? Oh man, I really know how you feel. Right? The truth is we really don't. We know how we feel. Right? What she's talking here about empathy is, is what I would call the healthy expression of empathy. Not walking around thinking that we're absorbing everybody else's feelings, but being so exquisitely aware of our own that we have developed the capacity to observe and identify what someone else is feeling without becoming enmeshed with them. Okay? She also, in this uh, principle, talks about an interesting phenomenon that I know we had explored uh, previously in the, the difference between intentions and outcomes. Okay? When we are truly empathizing with someone, we First of all, don't judge, right? Because we know we're all human. We are able to see through behavior into what their intentions were, right? And we can honor the intention, even if the behavior didn't quite turn out the way we would have wanted, as opposed to judging the outcome. Does that make sense? All right, when we're empathizing. So think about the last time, uh, if you're in a, a relationship, think about the last time that your partner gave you a gift, and it wasn't exactly the gift that you wanted, right? But you're able to appreciate it because you can appreciate their intention of giving you this gift. What's interesting and what psychologists have discovered is we tend to judge ourselves on our intentions you know, oh, I meant well. But we tend to judge others on their outcomes. <laughs> right? So empathy, being truly empathetic, is asking us to, to really kick that up a notch. First of all, don't judge to begin with. But to observe what might their intention have been. Principle number five, real is courageous. And I love that she uses the word courageous and not brave. Because courageous actually comes from the root core, C-O-U-R, which means of the heart. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So brave is the um, root of bravado, which is kind of that, you know, you know tough. And, right? But courageous is of the heart. Uh, this reminded me of a great quote that I love by Brene Brown. She said, courage is telling who you are with your whole heart. Courage is telling who you are with your whole heart. So real feels the fear and does it anyway. Real is willing to take risks. Real does the right thing even when it's not popular. Real is not afraid to fail. Real sees failure as a learning experience. Tony says, real knows that failure leads to growth, new beliefs are powerful, and courage comes with experience. Principle number six, real is honest. The only toy in the nursery who tells the truth is the skin horse. You know, it's interesting, when I first started this, I thought that 
um, the Velveteen principles were about the rabbit, but they were really about the skin horse. Because the skin horse became real a long time ago. The skin horse is so real. He likes who he is. He doesn't need to pretend or to posture or to brag. He's not perfect, and he doesn't need or want to be perfect. The skin horse has let go of perfect. You see, he knows that perfect is arbitrary. Think about this, okay? A hundred years ago, think about the different um, body images, all right? So many of you who know me know that I recently released about 30 pounds. I didn't lose them because I don't want to find them. <laughs> I released them, okay? Took it slow. Did it cool? Did it healthy? But but by Hollywood standards, if I were a model, I'd be a plus size, right? But a hundred years ago, I'd be unhealthily skinny, right? There were many many cultures where you know the husbands would always fatten up their wives because it meant that they were good providers. If your wife was skinny, it meant you were poor, right? So I I sharing that just to say that perfect is arbitrary, right? Perfect is also boring. Think about it. I mean, I think, isn't it our flaws and our idiosyncrasies and those little nuances that make us interesting, right? When we try to hide those, we become boring. I'm so happy you guys aren't boring. <laughs> We need to, or when we're real and we share who we are, that's when life becomes interesting. That's when we have rich conversations. That's when we go beneath all that superficial stuff, right? That's when we get real. That's when things get truly interesting. And human perfection, and I love that Tony points this out, is ultimately impossible. It is impossible for us to be perfect. But like the skin horse, who would want to be? Right? The other part of, of real that's honest is, is um, when we are willing to tell the truth about who we are. Many of you have done the standards of integrity exercise with me and other coaches throughout the years where it's simply an exercise where we discern who we really are in our hearts. And inevitably, someone will say to me, they look at all the amazing qualities that, that are a result of this exercise, and they say, oh, well, that person's amazing, that's not me. But it is you, right? And the transformation that happens when we claim that that's who we are really is amazing. It's so important. But when I, you know, when I say to to a, a, a client, you know, well, tell me who you really are, and they give me a litany of their faults. It's like, really? How about we talk about how amazing you are? Right? Because they're both true. Real acknowledges it all. <laughs> a wonderful quote by Macrina Biedercare. Oh God, help me to believe the truth about myself no matter how beautiful it is. <laughs> <laughs> So are we willing to tell the truth about ourselves and about everything, no matter how beautiful it is? Okay, here's your Star Trek reference for the day. <laughs> I know you guys were just waiting, right? Apparently, in his late 70s, after Leonard Nimoy, who just passed, lived long and prosper, said he was closer than ever to being as comfortable with himself as Spock always appeared to be. <laughs> And that just so reminded me of, you know, what was the second principle? It's a process. Real is a process. When we're real, we say what we mean, and we mean what we say. But I'd like to add a third piece to that. And when we say it, we're not mean. Real is not mean. We walk our talk, and we practice what we preach. That's real. Principle number seven. Real is generous. When we're real, we just naturally exude an energy of, of goodwill. We, 
we take delight in encouraging one another when we're generous. When we're generous, we understand that there's enough to go around. So we don't hold anything back when we're real. We don't buy into the scarcity thinking. We don't buy into competition. We don't buy in that in order for me to win, someone else has to lose. Real knows that win-win is always possible. Real understands the law of giving and receiving. Real understands that we are all one and that we're all connected. Real understands that what I give to you, I'm actually giving to myself. And so again, real doesn't hold anything back. Principle number eight, real is grateful. I had a friend say to me the other day, oh, I've just been in such a funk, Steph. What can I do to get out of this funk? He said, first of all, I want you to think of one thing that you have to be grateful for. Just one. So she thought about it for a while, and she came up with one thing. She shared it. I said, okay, now I want you to come up with ten more things. And I want you to keep thinking about what it is that you have to be grateful for. And I guarantee you, the more you do this, the less, the less of a funk you're going to be in and the more real you're going to be. We like to say that, that gratitude is the gateway to grace. Grace is that, that state of being that we're in when all of a sudden blessings just start to flow. Well, what creates that State of being is gratitude. Tony says that awareness and appreciation, I've actually never heard it talked about this way before, it was really kind of cool, are critical for gratitude. Awareness being that we actually pay attention to all the great stuff around us, and appreciation being that we're willing to appreciate it. That's using the word in the definition. So real is grateful. Principle number nine, real can be painful. Real can be uncomfortable. The skin horse was very truthful about this. Sometimes being real can be a little ouchy because sometimes what we're telling the truth about are things that make us uncomfortable, right? Sometimes when we are going through the process of creating a very real life, sometimes we look back on things that we've said or done and we kind of go, ow. Right? So real, again, is not about judging that or metaphorically beating ourselves up about it, you know, or walking around may and culpating constantly. But real says simply tell the truth. And if you need to make amends, do it. Right? Real can be a little uncomfortable, but my friend Maria likes to say, are a couple of moments, or maybe hours or days, of discomfort worth it for a lifetime of being real? Are we willing to be a little uncomfortable sometimes in order to be real? Real is flexible. We've already demonstrated that, right? Real is adaptable. Real adjusts quickly, right? Real doesn't dig its heels in when we're asked to change. This is part of being honest, too. What do I need to change? Real just changes. There's a wonderful teaching from the Tao Te Ching where Lao Tzu teaches the power of flexibility. He said, the living are soft and yielding. The dead are rigid and stiff. Living plants are flexible and tender. The dead are brittle and dry. Those who are stiff and rigid are the disciple of death. Those who are soft and yielding are the disciples of life. The rigid and stiff will be broken, but the soft and yielding will overcome. Real understands that. Real understands that change does not equal disaster. Being asked to change doesn't mean that we've done anything wrong. Change is natural. The I Ching has the most succinct teaching on change in every, any of the major uh, traditions. And that is, life is change. And I like to say, change is also life. Change does not mean that we feel failed. And most importantly, after a big change, whether it's a change in our lives, 
a change in our bodies, a change in our relationships, a change in our jobs. Life is not going to be the same. How many of us try so hard to hold on to what was? Or, here's the interesting thing, what we remember what was. Right? The good old days worked. Right? Our memories are so mutable. And so much of what we're trying to hold on to never even happened. Right? Real is present. When we're real, we hold ourselves lightly. Back to not taking things personally, and we don't take ourselves too seriously. Real goes with the flow. Or as we learned in seminary, Melanie, Wu Wei. We used to say, Wu Wei, baby. Go with the flow. Principle number 11. Real love endures. And I love Tony's teaching about this, but I also like Don Miguel Ruiz's just a little bit better, so I'm cheating here. And I'm going to share with you something from The Mastery of Love by Don Miguel Ruiz. Because I love this teaching on love, pun intended, redundancy. Intended. We can talk about love, and we can write a thousand books about it. But love will be completely different for each of us because we have to experience love. Love is not about concepts. Love is about action. Love in action can only produce happiness. Fear in action can only produce suffering. The only way to master love is to practice love. You don't need to justify your love. You don't need to explain your love. You just need to practice your love. <coughs> practice creates the master. He continues, the teachings that come from India, from the Toltecs, the Christians, the Greeks, from societies all over the world come from the same truth. They talk about reclaiming your divinity and finding God within you. They talk about having your heart completely open and becoming one. Can you imagine what kind of world this would be if all humans opened their hearts and found the love inside? Of course we can do it. Everyone can do it in their own way. It's not about following any one imposed idea. It's about finding yourself. When you love with no conditions, you the human and you the God, aligned with the spirit of life moving through you. Your life becomes the expression of the beauty of the spirit. Life is nothing but a dream. And if you create your life with love, your dream becomes a masterpiece of love. So when we become, we become willing to be real, and to focus on what our realness can create, we move into significance. And finally, principle number 12. Real is ethical. Tony says, the process of becoming real eventually makes us calmly content with ourselves, which means we no longer feel overwhelmed by self-consciousness and self-doubt. We are so comfortable in our own worth as human beings that we are able to act according to our highest values in a way that is practically automatic. And almost without trying, we begin to act in ways that are consistently ethical. Real understands that our actions have consequences. There's a ripple effect. And so we become exquisitely aware of our impact on others. When we become real, we live the golden rule, not because it's a rule, but because we can't help it. It becomes an extension of our realness. Ursula Le Guin wrote, as one's real power grows and their knowledge widens, ever the way they can follow grows narrower, until at last they choose nothing and do only and wholly what they must do. Real is ethical. So real happens when we are willing to see that we are exactly as God created us to be. I cannot tell you how much I miss that song. And thank you so much, Asha, for opening the service with that. That is the epitome of real. It's also what it means to be genuine. You know, I've, I've shared before that whenever you 
pick a subject for a talk, everything that is the talk shows up in your life. It just, that's why I never talk about patience or surrender, okay? <laughs> so, uh, one of my Facebook friends last week, as I was working on this, posted this wonderful essay on, on genuine, what it means to be genuine. And the essay was by a gentleman named Steve Toback. And just, just real briefly, I loved how he defines genuine. See how familiar this sounds. Genuine means actual, real, sincere, honest. Genuine people see themselves as others would if they were objective observers. There's not a lot of processing, manipulating, or controlling going on between what's in their head and what other people see and hear. Genuine people are more or less the same on the inside as their behavior is on the outside. Once you get to know them, genuine people turn out to be more or less consistent with the way they initially hold themselves out to be. What you see is what you get. Doesn't that sound like the 12 principles that we just talked about? So something interesting happens when we're willing to be real, to be vulnerable, to be open, to tell the truth about ourselves and others, to focus on love, to be genuine. Something interesting and wonderful happens, and that is that we start to see the world differently. We see ourselves differently, we see others differently, and we see the world differently because we're not interested anymore in pretending. All that energy that we spend keeping the mask on and trying to be something that we're not is suddenly released. You know, it's like when the kids were growing up, we said, always tell the truth, it's the easiest thing to remember. Right? Well, always be yourself. It's the easiest thing to be. And then all of that energy is freed up, and all of a sudden we have all sorts of enthusiasm for life. Our creativity blossoms. Ideas flow. There's more joy. There's more zeal. There's more enthusiasm. We have more fun when we're real. It's not magic. It's energy. And it happens as a part of the process. We don't even have to make it happen. It just happens. So I want to conclude with, with Tony's words. She observes how this happened for her. Understanding the importance of being real gave me a new perspective, what I would call a more realistic point of view, which slowly changed me. I started by trying to quiet that endlessly self-critical part of myself. I also began to embrace the quirky pieces of myself, my interest in art and my sense of humor, for example, and realized that I could be loved just as I am. Once you recognize the value of being real, you begin to see that you don't have to live the way everyone else lives. When this truth dawned on me, I started to create a customized life that nourished my individual interests. Real is a process. I took art classes. I put together my own little studio, and I began painting. I also began collecting found items. Some of these were things people had left for the trash on the side of the road. And I transformed them with paint or glass or bits of tile. In my own way, I made these cast-off things real by giving them care and attention I brought out their value. Gradually, everything around me seemed like it offered an opportunity for creative expression. In my kitchen, I made a mural out of pieces of broken china. In my front hallway, I stenciled swaying trees to mimic an aging fresco. In short, I began to feel happy being my real self. The self-acceptance that came with my intent to be more real made me feel less anxious and more comfortable in everyday life. It also affected the way that I viewed others. I became more patient, more open-hearted, and this immediately brought me closer to the people I love. This made sense. After all, if this new understanding gave me permission to be specifically myself, 
then I certainly had to extend the same permission to others. As part of this change, I became much more curious about what made people think and feel the way that they did. So I asked, and the answers were extremely interesting. I discovered that everyone's internal process was unique. I couldn't assume anything about anyone. Just as we know that no two snowflakes are identical, so it goes with real people. The variety is endless and delightful. Once you are real, you cannot become unreal again. It lasts.